September 9th of 1939, and then the following week on uh, November 16th, it transferred to the Blue Network, later to be known as ABC. Uh, the first uh, 28 shows went as a more of a test uh, broadcast uh, or a new drama. Let's see how the public feels about it. It was embraced pretty quick, so they uh, were quick to then copyright this show, starting with the uh, 29th broadcast uh, as King Tremble, uh, uh, Trendle uh, uh, Incorporated. And in 37, April, uh, May 4th of 37, it became incorporated as the Green Hornet uh, Incorporated for trademark purposes and has held that same uh, uh, trademark uh, uh, covered ever since. Um, a lot of the people that appeared um, on Hornet also were staff actors at WXYZ. They appeared on uh, Lone Ranger, they appeared on uh, uh, Challenge of the Yukon, Ann Worth Housewife, uh, and a number of other productions that WXYZ was doing at the time. It was kind of an in-house, like CBS had their West Coast actors, East Coast actors, and. And uh, so uh, they had mostly the people uh, only in the, the st at the station uh, were involved with the broadcast. Uh, WXYZ, um, while it was not necessarily the only station to be able to do this, was somewhat unique in the broadcast fields as uh, they were doing shows every bit as good as, if not, and sometimes exceeding the uh, standards of the network broadcast uh, on the east or west coast. It was not uh, typical for a local station to uh, do their own productions, uh, and, and especially productions of a, of a pretty good quality uh, and consistent writing. Uh, Fran uh, Stryker uh, was the, uh, credited <coughs> with a lot more than he actually uh, uh, did hands-on at, at a 100% rate. While he did start this show and, and, of course, The Lone Ranger and came up with many of the ideas that then became staple of the program, uh, Fran was really, uh, uh, after a period of time, the head writer and overseen and approved all the scripts for continuity, um, character development, and things like that. He didn't actually write every single script uh, as time went on because it, it was just becoming mind-boggling the amount of programming they were doing every week. But uh, for uh, legal legality purposes, of course, Trendle was copyrighted as, as a script author. I don't think he ever wrote you know, uh, wrote a script or, or even written a, a single line of dialogue, but for legality purposes and ownership purposes, I'm the author. Uh, usually it was Trendle slash some other author, Dan Beatty or, or Fran Stryker or somebody. Uh, and uh, in a lot of cases, the scripts uh, reflect who the actual writer is. Uh, the, if you look up in the copyright listings, uh, it's usually just a blanket coverage as Fran Stryker. So you really have to look to the scripts uh, or any recording uh, uh, information uh, on labels and things. Sometimes they did them on the ETs as to who the actual author was. I was very fortunate when I started collecting about 30, 35 years ago uh, in meeting a great number of these people that appear in these shows um, as well as network shows in general. And uh, I knew uh, Fred Flowerday, who uh, later went on to be director and uh, uh, one of the kingpins of, of production at WXYZ, and uh, another gentleman named Tony Caminita, who started out, both of them started out as sound effects people. When they quit production of live ro uh, programming with the Ranger in 54, they started special recordings in Detroit and then cut the shows down for syndication purposes on both uh, Ranger and Hornet. And uh, when they sold special recordings uh, a number of years later, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, go down and, and uh, do interviews with uh, Tony. And as I was leaving the uh, building, uh, they were probably within a week of actually walking out the door themselves for the last time. Uh, he happened to say, he said, by the way, he says, you know, he said, I've got a filing cabinet in the back. And uh, we've got a few things, if, you, if you're interested in any of that stuff, because we're just going to pitch it. And uh, back there uh, in the... It was, a, it was a storage room behind another storage facility, and we moved some filing cabinets to get the things that were in the back, and, and we probably could have used a couple of flat coal shovels to get rid of the dirt and debris in there. But we opened up these filing cabinets, and in there were amongst a lot of contracts and things that were, that were uh, kept on file. In the bottom of the filing cabinet, you know, they have these, these hanging folders when you pull the filing cabinet and you put stuff in. Well, when you take the hanging folders out, in the bottom of the drawers were all of these hand-kept FCC broadcast logs that they were required by law to keep. Tony's job uh, over the years was to write down the name of the script on the night of the broadcast. So copyright listings sometimes are inaccurate because they would submit 30 or 40 scripts ahead of time to Washington for copyright purposes. But Trendle a lot of times changed the order of broadcast. 
So Tony wrote them down in longhand, and I've got the original, um, uh, you know, uh, listings for years and years and years. And that was one of the only ways, short of recently getting all of the scripts, that I could actually determine who actually wrote the script because he would write down the date, the uh, script title, and the author. And Franz Stryker does not appear in very many of those listings, which gave me an early indication that Fran was not the author of everything. He was the, he was the head writer, and he was responsible for the property, but he wasn't necessarily the author of the individual scripts. So, um, and along with that, I got a trailer and a, a truck full of buckets of silver bullets and and uh, I, I don't know how many square inches of the great Yukon I own now, you know. From <laughs> <laughs> if I ever file my claim, I, I need to find out if they're all necessarily together and not one inch here and one over there 40 yards, you know. Um, and, and, it, it, right. Yeah, they haven't hit me for any property taxes yet. Um, but unfortunately and sadly, in this particular case, there was not a lot of Green Hornet stuff available. Most of it was, was Ranger. Uh, which is another big passion of mine. Uh, Green Hornet also, uh, with the uh, advent of the popularity of it on radio, naturally uh, it, it made a jump off to the movie serials. They did a couple of them. Uh, it made it into the television series in the uh, 60s. And uh, comic books, pulp, uh, a, a number of, of, of areas. Uh, it, was a, it was a pretty popular program. Um, a lot of people have asked, What's the link between, I hear there's a link between Lone Ranger and Green Hornet. And as you may or may not know, as the legend goes, and there are several different variations if you listen to the earlier recordings, but if you listen to only the later Lone Ranger recordings, this is the way everybody remembers it. There was a Butch Cavendish and he, and he trapped uh, 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 six Lone Ranger uh, or uh, six uh, Texas Rangers and thought he killed all of them, but there was one that was nursed back to health. Now, there's six or seven different versions of how he was nursed back to health, but the one we all remember is Tonto found him. But there's recordings that say otherwise. Um, but, as, but, but Reed, and regardless of what the documentation shows in books and trivia books, there is no evidence anywhere that I've ever been able to find that his, the Lone Ranger's first name was John. There is no evidence of that anywhere. It was never, it was, it's not in any of the scripts, it's not in any of the movies. There's no notes that, that the Striper family has allowed me unfeathered access into Fran's uh, uh, archives. Nothing has ever said John. Now, Dan Reed, his brother who was killed with the Cavendish gang, was a captain in, in the Texas Rangers. His name was Dan. We know that. But his brother's name, was they, they, they never listed a first name. Where John came from and how that urban legend started, I don't know. But he had a son named Dan Reed who rode with Lone Ranger for many years. And then as the, as the link goes between the two series, Dan Reed grew up and had a son, Brent Reed, who managed his father's newspaper, the Daily Sentinel. And that's where the connection is. And there are several storylines uh, in the radio show that will reflect back on that. And uh, there was a three-part uh, series done. There's a two-part series that was done earlier. Uh, where they identify who his great uncle was, and in the background is the William Tell Overture playing as the, you know, narrator is, or, or as the story is being told, uh, the connection. So um, there was a, a connection there. There was not that way. Uh, they didn't tie that in for a third time with with Ranger or whatever. Um, another urban legend. And again, it's reflected slightly erroneously in my law, which we are in the process of, of doing a massive update on. Cato, was he Japanese or Filipino? Anybody? Well, what's the year? What? What's the year? Is it 1941 before? Uh, either time. He started out as and ended up as. Partial. Of Ken Murray's Blackout, the El Capitan Theater, Hollywood, Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent Show, starring Bob Hope and his special guest. Al Jolson.